July 7th. Very typical summertime pattern here in Texas. Southerly winds, low clouds early in the day, thunderstorms during the afternoon, just scattered here and there, and a lot of debris cloud. Here's the satellite picture we have at 9.30 this morning. Look at that, we're starting out with showers across the Abilene area, all the way down to the Big Bend. I'm going to draw a couple marks on here, showing you the extent of the cloud cover area there near Abilene. This is the showers. The actual cells themselves are down in here. Elsewhere, got subtly flow streaming up from the Gulf, bringing in moisture and low clouds. And I'm going to advance this up to about the noon hour. Thunderstorms continue to developing around the Abilene area. And back building south of Big Bend, or not Big Bend, but Big Spring, and towards uh, just south of the Midland area. So you notice that there's kind of a linear appearance here. That's the cold front sinking southward. We saw that in yesterday's forecast presentation. And that cold front is just sinking south very gradually. We don't see that too often this time of year, but it does happen from time to time. Let's talk a little bit about radar. This is a typical chart that you might see on the internet. This one is from College of DuPage. I want to show you an example. See the storm right here southwest of San Angelo? Take a look and see how fine-grained it is, like the individual pixels. You got, got that memorized in your head? All right, we'll switch over to GR Level 2. Now look at it. Looks a whole lot more detailed, doesn't it? This is Level 2 NEXRAD data. It's the highest resolution WSR-88D radar data that we can get. And you see that line right there? Outflow boundary. You probably remember that from a few days ago when we talked about outflow boundaries. In fact, that might have even been last night. Since this boundary is pushed a few miles past this activity right here, we can assume that this activity is decaying and it's likely going to become less intense. However, this stuff here, the outflow boundary is probably further back into the precip area, so this may be actually a little more intense. What's a good way of seeing how severe these cells are without having warnings and watches? Just go up to the higher tilts. See what I'm doing here? I'm going up to the higher tilts. This is four degrees above the ground. This is pointing the radar six degrees. And eventually, if I keep doing that, I don't think I can show both of these on the same screen. See, I'm clicking eight. And eventually, I'll get up to the top of the storm. So right there, I'm going to leave a little mark right there. See, see a little mark that marks the very top of the storm. This is up at about, let's see, it's pretty close to the radar, so that's up at 33,000 feet. Now if I go back down to the surface, you can see that that top is almost directly over the precip area, so it's not leaning vertically. That's a good indication that the upper level winds are kind of weak, and the uh, storms are rising vertically and basically collapsing into themselves. Let's take a look at that other cell to the southwest. So here's the top on the southwest activity. See, I put that little mark right there, and I drop back down to the surface. And that's about directly over the precip area. So this is probably going to be relatively non-severe. About the only threat you would have is maybe gusty winds if there's a lot of dry air aloft. Lightning, of course, and possible heavy rain. But I don't think we need to worry about tornadoes or anything like that, or large hail. So I'm going to do something a little different today. For our surface map, I'm going to go to aviationweather.gov. That'll take me to a map showing hazardous flight weather in the U.S. And I'm going to click on TAFs. TAF is the coding form for surface observations. And the site will plot them all out for you. I'm going to zoom in on Texas, since that's what we want to check out. The site will plot that out, and you'll notice right away that there's a difference in the winds. See here, north of Texas, we've got winds coming out of the northeast. And in Texas proper, we have winds coming out of the south. So in between, we've got a boundary. 
That boundary goes all the way to Fort Stockton and back towards Marathon. That right there is the cold front coming out of Oklahoma. So I'm going to draw these barbs on to show that that's a cold front. How do I know that that's a cold front? Well, I'm just guessing. But usually when I see stronger winds north of the boundary compared to south, that tells me it's probably a cold front. If the winds down here are stronger than the winds up north, then it's probably a warm front because that implies there's a stronger push of warm air. I would actually say that this is probably a draw, so I'm going to make it a stationary front. I don't know that for sure, but this is just kind of an exercise to kind of show you how to analyze fronts. But basically, we got a boundary here. It's triggering all that thunderstorm activity. So anyway, I stopped the video to take a quick look at through here and see if there was a way of bringing up the temperature and dew point. I'm not really seeing that here, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Each website has its advantages and disadvantages. One other thing that's pretty cool about this website is you can increase the data density to pull up a few more observations in between and get a closer handle on what's going on. And just to wrap things up, I'm going to use a different site for the model data to show our forecast. I've went to weather.rap.ucar.edu. They have a weather web, web page. And from there I can go to forecast, click on the forecast tab, click loop all times, make sure we have the GFS up. And then I'm going to click on MSLP winds. This is mean sea level pressure and winds. So why do I think this is important? Normally I don't show the surface chart, but today we have a cold front in Texas and Oklahoma. You can just barely see it through here. Definite difference in the winds on either side of that. So the question is, what happens to that front? I'm going to take this forward. We're starting with this morning. 12Z is 7 a.m. And then we run that through till uh, tomorrow afternoon. This is showing us that the frontal boundary has kind of fallen apart. It's hard to see it. We've got strong southerly flow south of the boundary and kind of weak disorganized easterly flow north of the boundary. It looks like that front is lifting northward. We'll run this up 24 more hours to Thursday afternoon. Now we've got deep southerly flow across all of Texas. The boundary looks like it's lift, lifted up into Kansas. And continuing onward through the weekend, just boring southerly flow. Looks like the sea breeze will be the main player. We may have a trough out west of Amarillo that'll kick off late afternoon thunderstorms each day, but those should stay in the panhandles. Then getting into next week, it looks like just the southerly flow continues. There's some hint of another cold front coming through Kansas around Monday. But as far as the GFS is concerned, that stays mostly north of Texas. And even on Wednesday, it looks like this is mostly an Oklahoma and far northern Texas panhandle situation. And now we're looking at 250 millibar winds on that same website. 250 millibars is at about 34,000 feet. So it's very similar to the 300 millibar product that I usually show you. Remember, these upper level charts are not meant to be technically complex or confuse you, but just to give you an overall view of the general situation. And in this case, it's actually pretty simple. We've got a ridge over the central US or over Texas. See that right there? That's where the winds kind of like change direction and become northerly. So this is basically high pressure covering Texas. Normally that keeps us shut down. But today we have that cold front sinking through Texas and Oklahoma. When you have a cold front and very strong low level moisture, then all bets are off. You may just get thunderstorms like we did today. Running that forward. There's been a very significant change in the models for tomorrow. See, we're going up to Thursday evening. This strong upper level flow, you remember the past few days we were talking about that and the models were pushing it up into Nebraska. Well, it actually links up with this low pressure system in Mexico 
And then by Thursday, yeah, by Thursday morning, we get a band of that upper level flow pushing into West Texas. So it looks like kind of an active weather pattern west of Fort Worth, west of San Antonio, may get some thunderstorm activity out in that area. But as we go on to Friday, that breaks down, the ridge reestablishes itself over Texas, and that band of jet stream energy pushes northeast into the central plains. So for the most part, with this ridge building back in across Texas, high pressure, see that right there across the central, central Texas, that should keep us in pretty good shape for the weekend. See, we're up to Saturday. Then we move things forward to Sunday. Upper level ridge hangs on. But it looks like we got a little band of easterly setting up along the Texas Gulf Coast. So we may see a little shower activity picking up in the Houston, San Antonio area, starting about Sunday, going into Monday. And then Texas just kind of stays under high pressure. Might get a little bit of that jet stream energy in the east part of the state around Tuesday. But it looks like things will stay in pretty good shape. So I hope you enjoyed that, even though we did run kind of long. We'll be back tomorrow, and I hope you'll join us. Thanks for watching the Texas Weather Forecast. All right, it's very hazy this afternoon, but you can identify two main kinds of thunderstorm clouds. I'm not even sure these are thunderstorms. They're probably showers. But down to the southwest, right here, you can see kind of like cauliflower tops. This is new uh, new cumulonimbus clouds. That's mostly updrafts. So that's where your heavier showers are going to be. And if we look off to the west, we still have cumulonimbus tops, but they're a lot more glaciated. So instead of super cooled water like we have to the southwest, these are more ice crystals. So this is older development. These are anvils from storms that are in the process of decaying. So there could be some new development somewhere around there, but for the most part here, we're seeing older showers that are kind of falling apart. You can see right there, that's a mature thunderstorm. Probably not just dissipating yet, because we can see those distinct cauliflower-like tops. So that's a relatively young storm, and we may hear some thunder here shortly. Just now starting to form an, an anvil right there. So yeah, I know I'm, I'm not showing you a whole lot today, but I'm trying to get these videos cranked out as early as possible. Last night I waited until 11 o'clock to start making the video, and I didn't get it up there till 1 in the morning. I figure if this is the July 7th forecast, might as well get it out on July 7th, if you know what I mean. So we'll get this video up, line, up, up and online and maybe figure out some interesting stuff to throw on, after, on there later. I expect I'll probably be doing a little more traveling next week so we may get some interesting footage then. Some people and some scenes, that kind of thing. And I happen to be standing in that grass right there. That's a good way to get ticks and chiggers usually in the spring, but this time of the year in July we don't have to worry about that so much. Just have to watch out for rattlesnakes and that kind of thing. They can certainly be in there. There we go. I think we're going to get the forecast sounding a lot better now. Lots of fun trying to get the video codecs working correctly. Well, 15 minutes later we're just sitting here reading Reddit. Well, it's 10 minutes later and we're still working, but I was looking at this article here on Reddit. 1915, a rail railway trolley car crashed in Ontario. It kind of blows my mind that if you were 20 when this happened, you would have been growing up around the turn of the century, barely any electricity, and then when you're on old age, it's the 1960s and you've got Woodstock and you could be listening to Crosby, Stills and Nash and Joni Mitchell. It's just amazing how much the world would have changed in your lifetime. Well, I don't have any other ideas for stuff to add to the video, so I'm going to leave you with my That's your cookie. long gone dog, Abby, a cattle and sheepdog, trying to eat a cookie through a blanket. This isn't working too well.
Hey, Abby. Abby, come here. Good dog. <laughs>